Hey people, welcome back to the channel and thank you very much for joining me on a special impromptu show. I've named it Manager Carnage. I think the title speaks for itself, really. Um, just when Liverpool are engrossed in one of the most amazing title races for many a year to come, 10 league games to go, all eyes on, on this league title race. Um, Jürgen Klopp a few weeks ago announces of course that he's going to leave at the end of the season and so therefore the hunt well the hunt for the new Liverpool coach started um, and we all thought we all thought and every journalist worth any salt suggested Zabi Alonso would be the favorite but last night was it last night Mush it was last night yesterday yeah the yesterday? press conference yeah yesterday yeah well the press conference today bombshell Zabi Alonso has decided to stay at Liverpool, uh, to stay at Leverkusen, I should say. I wish he stay, decided to stay at Liverpool. Um, we will discuss the, the 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 offset of that. What now for Liverpool? Who do we target? Who's the favourite? Has any talks taken place? And if so, what are the attributes of these said coaches? Joining me is Mush, of course. Mush, how are you doing, my friend? Hope uh, fasting is going well. By the way, people, smash up the like button and everyone who's fasting i know there's only about an hour to go but stay strong stay in there if you're in the uk that is we're nearly there we're nearly there mush how are you keeping that's it man i'm good thank you i'm healthy i'm happy anyone who's fasting look if you can't handle the one hour running how are you going to handle the title running guys okay you'll be all right you'll be all right okay um and i'm really excited man i actually did a bit of um how Not only did I do, do some research for the episode, but I did a bit of checking up on myself. So I went on to Twitter and I checked um, Alonzo. And then I searched my my name on Twitter um, to see if I'd actually said anything about him or if I've been involved. And I can proudly say that I have not given any opinions on any managers. This is the first time I'm having a manager chat. So... So yeah, I'm 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 looking forward to giving my thoughts. I know a lot of people in the comments will have been very invested in in the outcomes of today, but um, yeah, no one's dressed as a judge today. I'm coming as a fan, so we're all good. Amazing, amazing. Well, yeah, exactly. People that uh, didn't get that reference, go and check out the last show where we had Judge Mush uh, evaluating uh, Liverpool players and what should happen to them over the summer. Um, none of your business says, says I'm available for the manager's job. Does anyone fancy being my assistant? Let him know, people, if you fancy assistant to the assistant. regional manager. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, exactly. Exactly. Uh, Michi says, Hit the likes, man. Let's go. Let's go. Um, it's my says, I'm starving, not gonna lie. Until the 10th day, it's easy for me. Nah, you should be all right. You'll be fine now. Big up, Grizz, Mush, and Zach. Big up the chat. Tap the like on your way in, people. Um, listen, when we have anything to do with European football worldwide football and i'd say actually he might disagree but i'll say it anything specifically portuguese related of course the magnificent zach lowry has to be invited on and zach has of course been kind enough to join me again zach how are you it's a pleasure having you back pleasure to be back grizz nice to meet you mush uh ramadan kareem to you both hope thank you bro is very uh is, is very satisfying tonight but um, <laughs> but yeah i'm very excited to be on and discussing uh today's topics um we have can you confirm this zach hey zach we went to high school together and we played soccer as Whoa, you say together is, yeah i definitely remember rajul uh amazing rajul was was zach good i want you rajul to give us the breakdown <laughs> zach on definitely can good. zach can definitely Talk a good game. Let but was he a baller? Him. Was he living the can life? He, can he walk the walk as well? <laughs> nah, listen, I I have actually improved since high school. So Rachel, <laughs> oh. I'm like whenever I'm I'm uh, prepping my boys, I'm always trying to use my left and work on my weak foot. Like I've gotten way better at juggling. So uh, so so yeah, I think that I I I am getting a lot better at techers. Once I go, once I make okay. it to England, I'm gonna show off my skills in a I need you I need you to send me a video of yourself I need proof <laughs> all right I can't okay. believe this I need yeah. video uh, send me a video uh, ask him from being up it's coming <laughs> okay I'll believe you for now uh, ask him ask him is in the chat he says are you on the bus 
Uh, Asim from Born and Red, if you haven't checked out Born and Red, make sure you do so. Born and Red, another YouTube channel that is doing fantastic work. Go and check out the guys. Uh, are you on the bus? Um, me and him have been having a private joke for a number of weeks now. This title winning bus, this is supposed to be. Uh, Mush, are you on the bus? Are we going to win the league? Or are you still waiting at the bus stop and thinking, I I'm going to jump on any second, but then you stop any second? Uh, Where are you? Grizz, I'm I'm on the bus collecting tickets, man. You you can't get on the bus unless you go past me, man. I'm I'm firmly firmly okay, here. Okay, there really. you go. Amazing, amazing. Very quickly before we get into the manager carnage, um, where are you, Zach, on the title race? Looking from afar. Um, very very no, far. We might add. very far. No <laughs> dog in the race, so to speak. But well, it's amazing. I'd love to get your insight into what you think the state of play is. Man, it's. It, I think that it's pretty much like 33, 33, 33. I feel like it's anybody's game, to be honest. Um, I, I think that there, there are so many different reasons to back each one. I think on the one hand, Liverpool, they have done just a phenomenal job of, of picking up form and just uh, really, you know, finding their groove, uh, especially since Klopp's departure. I think that really could have gone one of two ways, right? It could have inspired... Yeah. Uh, the players to play out of their skins and it also could have uh, left them dejected and feeling with with a sense of uncertainty and it's clearly done the former as far as Arsenal goes I just I mean they're blowing teams out right now uh, they're just scoring for fun and I, I feel like you know obviously they are the team who who control their destiny right they still have quite a few challenges coming up but it's, it's definitely hard to look past them at the moment. Mm. And as far as City goes, I mean, they have the experience, they have world-class players. But if I'm being honest, I, I feel like actually, it, I I think it'll be either Arsenal or Liverpool. I don't think City. Ooh, wow. I think wow. it'll be like a 32% chance. I don't know. I, it's Like I said, it's really hard to, to, um, to look past City. Uh, but they are obviously dealing with quite a few other competitions, as are the other teams. So yeah, like I said, it, it's really a coin flip at the moment. It's a, it's a, it's a title race for the ages, in my opinion. I think yeah. this is going to be uh, probably going down to the last, at least I think, couple of weeks. Mush, I can't see it being decided like three, four weeks out. I Same. just can't because the fact that there's three teams involved this time round as opposed to two, right? It makes a huge difference. And two of them play off against each other this weekend. Wow. It's only going to be a good watch if we win. If we've done an the hour, job. An hour before. Otherwise, there's my face is going to be <laughs> the worst face in the world to look at as that game is kicking off. So Yeah, uh, it's, it's not the best at the best of days. But anyway, we're moving on swiftly. Moving on very, very swiftly. Um, Jay says, hearing different things. Some say Amarim is attacking. Others say he's pragmatic. We will let Zach... Uh, educate us and inform us on what he thinks. Uh, we will be speaking on all uh, managers and links very, very soon. Um, Mosh, as you said, you typed in uh, Alonso um, in the in your search engine to see what you've been saying about him. If you've been on the Alonso fan train or fan bus, I guess mm -hmm. uh, using Asim's terminology there, where was you? With, with in terms of Alonso being the new coach of Liverpool Football Club, and where was you when the announcement came that he's no he's no longer going to be considered for the Liverpool job this time round? The two emotions, please. Yeah, I think um, a big thing that I've probably been doing since Klopp's announcement is I've been so mentally invested in taking in every moment of Jurgen Klopp being the Liverpool manager now, that I've actually given what's to come and stepping into the unknown very little thought. And that's largely because, A, I can't control it, and B, we're just so... We've got so much to deal with this season that, that mm. what happens next season just doesn't matter right now because I also think winning a title and things like that may change the picture for certain players and the kind of manager, the kind of targets the club has as well. So I don't think I've been too fixated on who the next Liverpool manager is going to be. But that question you asked about Alonso, Chris, I think if we're talking about playing football, Xavi Alonso is one of my 
football playing heroes in terms yeah. of how I love, yeah, stylistic, how I love to play the game, the, you know, the, the humble levels that I've played up to. He's, he's always been someone I've aspired to. Can I get videos of what? you as well, please? So can I, I get don't videos mind. of I Zach think... and videos of you as well, please? Thank you very much. I think I've got some, so I'll be able to. <laughs> get some. But um, I think the big thing for me is Xabi Alonso is evidently someone who the way he thinks about football translates to how he plays about football. So you always yeah. know that he embodies the best parts of the game. And this Leverkusen team is out of this world at the moment. How many... Like, you know, this last decade where Bayern have just walked this league to be 10 points clear for it to basically be done. He's having his special moment in his career very, very early. And I think people are making a lot of likenesses to Jurgen Klopp and taking on Bayern in that sense. And I think hopefully Zach being here and one thing that's going to become more and more evident is that where the Jurgen Klopp Alonso likenesses are very visible, there are other managers who have things that Jurgen Klopp has had to endure that they've also had to endure in their career. And I'm really looking forward to exploring that. So I haven't tied my flag to any particular mast. I've just been very open in terms of what nah, information. Best way, to be, best way to mm. be, very, very sensible way to be. Uh, not many sensible people like you. Uh, Zach, I'm, I was a little bit different. Zach, I was very much in the Alonso camp. Not to talk down the credentials of the other people that we're going to speak on, but just with the sentimental value, the love affair, the 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 Zabi Alonso, the, the the coming back to Liverpool, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Where do you? How do you see his decision to continue the project for now at Leverkusen? Is it come a surprise to you that he's decided to stay, or does it show? I guess the class of the guy, the, the 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 sort of where he is in terms of his own mindset, because a lot of people speak about him as a player, very calm, very assured, knew how he wanted to play the game while he still was a player. Is this how he is as a coach and a man as well? Yeah, well, first of all, yes, it did surprise me because okay. uh, obviously Bayern and, and Liverpool, you know, they're they're on the lookout for new managers. Um, and he obviously has experience playing for both of those clubs. With that being said, though, I, I do think that uh, he's shown before that he's, uh, you know, he, he is a very measured person who takes his time, and he definitely believes that patience is a virtue, right? I remember back in, like, 2021, after uh, one or two years of managing Real Sociedad's B team, and he had an offer to join Gladbach, uh, he turned it down to stay at Real Sociedad's B point, team. Point. And then yep. shortly after, he wound up at Leverkusen and, uh, you know, taking them from just outside the relegation zone to, what, I think sixth place and uh, and and the Europa League semifinals in his first season. And, and this season, I mean, it's just been spectacular. Um, I think that he has definitely shown that he's going to be, if not, he, yeah, you know, he probably already is one of the best managers in Europe. Um, and yeah, I remember, I think their first game of the season against Leipzig, how they just managed to just dominate their opponent and just showcase uh, their, their, their unique approach to the game. And for me, he's just done a phenomenal job. I, I have to be honest, I'm really happy that he's staying. But uh, I think that, you know, from, from a lot of people's perspectives, they were saying, well, you know, it's impossible for Leverkusen to um you know to, to get better than this when they're literally unbeaten going into april but i think it definitely shows uh a, you know a very good uh, mentality you know he, he wants to be able to to try to push his own expectations and and try to take this team into the champions league right we've seen so many managers lead their teams to the promised land and then jump ship right we saw that just last year with spalletti at napoli um, so I think that it's a really smart decision. I think it's clear that Leverkusen will probably lose its, like one or two key players, whether that's Frimpong, Grimaldo, uh, Wirtz, you know, whoever. But he's just done a phenomenal job. And and I really just love how the fact that whenever Leverkusen go down, which isn't that often, they really won't change the way they play. They won't panic. They'll just keep on pushing their their that same approach. Uh, so I just think he's done a phenomenal job. I think that, to be honest, this is like the first time that I can remember that 
probably two of the top five teams in world football are playing in the Europa League with Leverkusen and, and Liverpool. Um, Great point. Great point. Yeah. They're doing phenomenally. So I think that there are definitely a few reasons why he chose to stay put. I think on the one hand, he, you know, obviously he knows that uh, Real Madrid is is a very attractive possibility. It's not going to be a vacant uh, position this summer with, with Ancelotti staying, but there's a good chance he could take over in the summer of 2025. So I think that's in the back of his mind. I also think that he wants to, he, he wants to incentivize his players. I think that if he were to leave this, um, you know, ha- have this cloud hanging over the players, I think that perhaps would seep into their mindset and thinking, well, could this be the, the last of, of the glory days, right? Could this be mm. the end of an era? He wants their players, he wants his players to be motivated, which is winning their first major trophy since 1993. Um, so I, I really admire it. And as somebody who, I, you know, somebody who's kind of become a Leverkusen fan this season, I, I love the Like so many others. At the Bay Arena, he's, he's done a ma- magnificent job. And uh, I just love the way that they play football. Mush, Zach saying that he's really um, applauds mm. Alonso's decision to stay. Obviously, the Liverpool fan base, sections of it will look at it differently. Some will say he, he's bottled it, to term a phrase, um, to use a phrase. Um, some would say it's a brave decision. Um because opportunities to mm. manage Liverpool Football Club don't come round much often. Do you think it shows in his mind clarity and confidence that it will come round again? Because, guys, this is his second full season as a coach. First Things can happen. Season. First, First full season. He joined, he joined them, yeah, when they were 16th, sorry, yeah. last season. So this is his first full season and it's been a magnificent season unbeaten the football is as 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 zach says so many non uh neutral fans have become leverkusen fans as their second team does he believe in his ability to big jobs will come around like the madrid like bayern munich like liverpool again it's not a problem do you see it as he's shied away or being a coward and not taken stepped in Jurgen Klopp's footsteps because some people are saying he, yeah. he, 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 you know he, he didn't see it he, he thought oh I can't do this now or do you see the the other side of it yeah I, I think that there's a few things that that need to be considered here and I think firstly that question you asked about what do I make of Alonso having made this decision I actually have a lot of respect for the intelligence of which he made that decision by. The first thing that I noticed was in the press conference, he said that we have had so many games that this international break was the first time I was able to even think about these, you know, choices that I can make properly. And that speaks of someone who doesn't get swept up in the hype and the momentum that's happening. It's someone who's tries to, you know, sit in a silent dark room and let there be silence for the first time. I think the the other thing which is important to note is that for for every young manager who comes in the scene, not everyone flourishes straight away. Not everyone makes a good job. A great example I want to give, because we all look at history kind of from the present moving backwards, but we all live moving forwards, right? So look at someone like Andre Villas-Boas and the stock he came in with at Chelsea after a Porto side, which was incredible, by the way, this wasn't just a good Porto side. This was a manager who had lifted all of those players up flourishing in the Europa league, an incredible record in the Portuguese league came to Chelsea and couldn't adjust. So maybe Xabi Alonso is thinking about the fact of a, this is the first time I'm probably going to win a title. All of the things of I'm part of a selling club. What happens when I need to rejig my team? What happens when you have players who aren't as motivated in the second season versus the first season? These are things you can't experience until they come along. So you can't go to a new club and fast track all of those experiences. Life doesn't work that way. So I actually respect that He knows that there are bigger stages than Bayer Leverkusen, but there are life experiences that I can learn in my coaching career now at Leverkusen that will hold me in good stead 
the moment I get to your Madrids, your Bayerns, your Liverpools. So I completely understand his thinking. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. And you're right. The, 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 so what we know him as a player, as you said, he's your one of your favourite players. I've got a wild, wild hot take that I shouldn't really speak about now, but I wasn't his biggest, biggest, biggest fan. When we okay, yeah. interesting. Biggest, biggest, biggest. Like I was a big fan, but not his biggest, yeah. biggest fans. I just thought, you know, Premier League was a bit too quick for him at that stage. But of course, you know, you can't doubt his ability. He was a magnificent player. I was more in the Steven Gerrard all action, you know, in the combination yeah, yeah, of the yeah. two. Do you get it? Um, but listen. You weren't a Mascherano fanboy, Grizz. I'm, I'm disappointed, man. Massive. <laughs> Massive. I love, he was infectious, though, Mascherano. Mascherano, was, I'm sorry you've made yeah. me digress and get off topic now, but <laughs> Mas, Mascherano was the man. People, if you don't remember Mascherano, go and check out some YouTube videos. And he went on to, to perfect another position at the greatest yeah. club side in world football, where he ended up playing centre-back. That shows you the quality and the intellect, footballing intellect of this guy that everyone thought he's just a destroyer. Uh, excuse me, he went on to play in the most, the best footballing side ever created, I think, that Barcelona team. And he was the instigator of the moves from... from can I, can I just season. say, Grizz, at Barca, Mascherano was this amazing composed centre-back, but the way he played for Liverpool... Monster. I, I will argue that he maybe not as good, maybe 5% less, but he was the only player who was N'Golo Kante before N'Golo Kante. So it was like having three players in midfield doing the running by one man, basically. Brilliant. Like it was, it was unbelievable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. big, but big let's, not, let's not get off track. We've got so much to talk about. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Big up, uh, Big Six Diamonds is like, share, subscribe, su support your quality channel. Come on, guys. There's 250 of you guys in here. I smash up that like button before we get into the nitty gritty of, of all things. We've got a super chat that I want to address... Uh, if if you may, Zach, I'll ask you. Isn't Alonso? Uh, thank you, Morton Pedersen. He says, "Isn't Alonso style more like Man City's? LFC has a way of playing that reflects the club from the youngest team. Isn't it more natural to find someone who plays more similarly to Klopp?" So we're talking about Alonso's playing style um, in terms of comparing it to Klopp's playing style, Zach. Before we move on briefly, what do you what do you think about this? Um, no, I mean, I think that obviously Alonso plays with a 3-4-3, three, three, whereas Klopp has, has never shown a tendency for a back three. But I do think that apart from the formation, I think that a lot of the ethos and, and the, the main ideas are similar. I think that one thing that has really defined this Liverpool era is, is Gagan pressing, you know, pressing uh, right after winning the ball and, and trying to recover in dangerous positions. And I think that Leverkusen do a fantastic job of that. Um, yes, you know, perhaps they're more uh, predicated on having possession and, yeah. you know, trying to uh, plug away. And, you know, so I, I guess I, one thing I will say about Alonso is you can clearly tell that he has been coached by some of the greatest managers of all time, right? V Vicente del Bosque, wow. Jose Mourinho, uh, Rafa Benitez, right? So, so all of these managers have instilled certain things in his tactical identity. And so I, I think that because of that, it's a bit hard to pigeonhole him. But I just think that what, what he's been able to do is really uh, showcase a tactical identity and instill that in every single one of his players. Um, but yeah, I think that with regards to Morton's question, it's it's impossible to find somebody who's going to be a like-for-like -like, uh, replacement for, for Klopp. You know, I, I can't think of a single manager who plays just incredibly similar. I think that what, what he's been able to achieve at Liverpool and Dortmund it's something we're we're not going to see for quite a while. It's it, it's brilliantly segues into the purpose of today's show, which is but we must find a successor to Jurgen Klopp. We may not find a person on his level or charisma or aura or call it what you want, but we must mush. As hard as it is to ignore that chat, and I'm with you. We need to focus on the final 10 games of this, what could be one of, a, one of the most greatest, greatest final swan songs ever. But it could also end in tears. I think it will end in tears. Not the fact that I don't think we win anything, but the fact that when Jürgen Kopp leaves this football club, there will be tears. There will be tears. But then we must, and I think it's imperative, we have a coach capable of managing Liverpool Football Club. Um, 
straight away Ruben Amrim's name has been it's been floating about with alongside Xavi Alonso but it's come to the forefront now um I know you said you've done a bit of research and a bit of homework, but very briefly before we get the before we get the experts' opinion on him and insight on him, what is your view and an opinion of the mention of Ruben Amram and the Liverpool job? Yeah, um, I guess my, my research is very uh, is very much in the embryonic stage. You know, I've, <laughs> I've just started it, so I'm not going to claim to have been someone who's been watching as an admirer for a long time. You haven't been following Ruben Amram no, since he was I... 16, collecting coaching badges uh, uh, in Portugal. No, you know what. Based on Twitter, I think I'm the only one who hasn't. So, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to have to be the anomaly here. But You're the anomaly. Um, I, I am going to say I have found out some incredibly encouraging things about Ruben okay. Amarim. Um, some amazing, I'm sure Zach's going to go into it and then I'll probably add the things I've noticed. But I've spotted things that are special moments so far in his career and how he's built things that translate a lot to Liverpool. I think a lot of what, you know, Morton, who, who gave us that question earlier about Jurgen Klopp's style of play, I think what's more important than style of play is a connection to the energy and emotion of playing for Liverpool. You look at someone like Rafa Benitez, right? Nothing like Jurgen Klopp in terms of his approach to football, his enemy, I mean, his energy, sorry, towards football, but he still captured what it meant to have those high octane nights on, on those big European nights and things like that. So I don't think there's a style of play that needs to translate, but people need to understand the emotion of it. And Ruben Amarim is an absolute darling of the media, his players, the journalistic view of, of Ruben Amarim. Like this is someone who, you know what we always talk about, Grizz, of we love Jurgen Klopp the person. What's been a big standout to me is Ruben Amarine, the human being, is what's really, really coming through in my research as well. So, yeah, we'll get into his story, I'm sure, with Zach. But there are some special things that I'm finding out about this man. Uh, shout out to Tom Little who's in the chat, who's been a big advocate. Tom's been on my channel. Uh, yeah. quite a Tom, few has been, Tom has been, literally, he is the captain of that ship, I've got he to say. He's the captain of the Amarim ship, and uh, yeah. it looks like... Um, it might be coming uh, home. His ship might be coming home. Uh, Zach, Ruben Amrim, uh, take it away. I mean, many, many listeners, viewers, subscribers will be intrigued to know, um, I guess, as much as we know, you can tell us about him in terms of his backstory. So, so Ruben Amrim, uh, how, we, we just spoke about Zabi Alonso in his first full season. Ruben Amrim is, if I'm not mistaken, one of the youngest coaches out there right now also yeah i mean with regards to ruben amarim he uh you know was a player at benfica never quite set the world alight i think kind of struggled with injuries but was a decent squad player um had to hang up his boots at a fairly early age and then yeah made his way into coaching um you know i think his first job was at casa Pia, and he was he was doing quite well there but then uh, it was out that he did not have the requisite coaching license and, you know, he was banned and, uh, you know, I think even thought about giving up management. But, uh, no, he left his position. They still ended up getting promoted thanks to the foundations he set. And then, you know, got back on the, the train, uh, took a job with Braga's B team shortly after, was coaching Braga's first team, did quite well there in terms of, uh, you know, pr helping usher in these promising young stars like Francisco Trincao. And uh, just a th just like three months after coaching Braga, which of course was his first uh, top level job, he ends up getting uh, getting the call to coach Sporting in March 2020, right before, on the this Before you year. do go and watch, I've got one question. I know you've got yeah. loads of questions. I'm dying as well. And I'm oh, not even questions. Questions. I wanted to add a statement to this, what Zach was saying. Add a statement, then I'm, I'm going to ask a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll add the statement because this is exactly about the time frame Zach's talking about, which is when Ruben Amarim went from Braga to Sporting Lisbon, Sporting Lisbon, after just 13 games of seeing what Ruben Amarim could do, paid the second highest release clause ever for a manager to get him in, in a league that never spends money. They spent 15 million yeah. euros oh, wow. to actually get him in. That was 
what they notice within just 13 games to get him in and transform sport. Zach, what is it that made them do that? Because Mosh is right. We know the Portuguese league in terms of how much money they create in terms of selling players and coaches going away, release clauses, etc. Very rarely do they spend that kind of money to bring someone of the caliber of uh, Amrim in. What is it that they saw at such an embryonic stage? Um, yeah, I mean, you'd you'd have to ask Frederico Varandas. I think that they they probably saw a very good him. communicator, somebody <laughs> who's incredibly good at at just dealing with these young players and and you know instilling that tactical philosophy. Um, but I, I think that it's, it's you know every pretty much everybody, including myself, was quite skeptical when when mm-hmm. this decision came because Sporting, you know, at that time uh, had not won a league title since two thousand two. And uh, yeah, for the most part, the managerial position uh, was was somewhat of a uh, poison chalice, um, just just a, a place where really a lot of talented managers have come and have been a- unable to to showcase their ability. And uh, of course, it was just what a few years removed from uh, when sporting fans invaded the club's training campus and yep. uh, you know attacked players and sabotaged them ahead of the cup final. Um, so yeah, it, it is. A, it definitely isn't a stretch to say that Sporting were um, were were an also ran at that point. That that Portuguese football was not a three horse race. It was a two horse race. It was a duopoly. And so I, I do think that there is really a before and after, just like there is with with Liverpool. You know, uh, because when when Liverpool when Klopp took charge of Liverpool, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that they were one of the laughing stocks. Of English, yeah, 100%. Um, obviously, just a year removed from them bottling the league title, but like they, they obviously had never won a, a Premier League title at that point, and so, so even though you know currently Liverpool only have one Premier League title to their resume, there is still a before and after with Klopp, um, and and I think that he's been able to, to take them into one of the most dangerous teams in England and and all of Europe. And I think that's that's a bit similar to what Amorim has been able to do, taking them uh, to to you know from a point where they were well, yeah, at that point actually they were on track to finish fourth behind Braga even. Um, so I think that it's it's you have to look at where he started off and where he's been able to take them right now. Uh, you know, on course to win their second league title in the past four years. Um, and yeah, I, I think that he's just done a phenomenal job. And no matter what happens this season, even if they end up blowing the league title to Benfica, uh, and he, he leaves on that note, Amorim will, will go down as money well spent. He'll go down as somebody who really helped, uh, you know, revolutionize the club and, and bring their confidence back. And I, I think that um, another thing that makes him a really attractive um proposition for a lot of top clubs is his ability to work with young players you know i remember like a day or so after uh they they announced this deal to pay what like 15 million for amorim and uh verandas was was being questioned by everybody you know even luis figo the exporting man was saying this is madness to paying this much money for somebody with just a few months of managerial experience and Varandas, the president, went out and said, uh, Mateus Nunes, like the sale of Mateus Nunes will pay for Amorim's, uh, you know, uh, arrival. And this was when Mateus Nunes had not even played a single match wow. with Sporting. So he knew that Amorim was going to be able to get his hands on these players like Mateus, which of course he did. And within like a year or two, he was going to Wolves for like 40 million or so. Um, so he's just been a really good uh, manager in terms of dealing with these young players, in terms of young. getting them up yeah. to speed. And th- there are really so many examples of that. I mean, Nuno Menge, uh was, you know, he he debuted in like June 2020 during Project Restart. And within literally a year, like maybe yeah, even yeah, less yeah, than a year, yeah, right? he was on his way to Paris Saint-Germain for like 40, 50 million. There are so many examples of that. But overall, he's just been able to really roll with the punches, and he's he's had to lose a lot of great players like Mateus Nunes, Nuno, like Joao Palinha, Pablo Sarabia, and yet continuing to build 
continuing to hold on to his philosophy, and uh, we've seen how that has paid dividends. Mush, I, I, I was going to say, I yeah, was going to ask you something. Mush, I was going to yeah. ask you something. Go on. Listening to Zach there, right, speak mm. about player development, increasing their values. <laughs> There's a lot of FSG thought thought patterns behind there, isn't there? There's a lot of I mean, strategy that we love about Jurgen Klopp and his ability to to unearth gems. Now, all those players Zach mentioned, pretty much unless you're an avid, avid Portuguese fan, would not have heard of. But like he said, over the last year or two, all household names. And probably, no, in fact, actually, literally, all attribute their moves or their careers to this man. Why, that well, is why, something why don't we, we love, right? Why don't we add some names to that list, Grizz? Why don't we add a certain Rafa Liao to that list? Why don't we add a someone, certain Manuel Ugarte to that list who went from six went, went for what sixty five million? Jokeres, the one who's you know ripping up the moment from Coventry City, coming here now. Now that thing you said about FSG, the big thing I think people know is obvious is that FSG normally do not sign the household name when they when they get a player. It's about developing the player. The big difference is that. When you manage a club like Liverpool, normally the, Liverpool is the pinnacle of their career. You don't risk li- really using them, losing them. You can see out their best years rather than having to see them go and, you know, having to start the whole process again. I think the thing in years gone by is if we look at the likes of Jurgen Klopp, if we look at the likes of Jose Mourinho when he was at Porto, for example. Football 10 years ago to 15 years ago, players would give you two or three years before they moved on. But what we've learned now, and Zach, I'm sure you would have seen it in Portugal, someone like Enzo Fernandes spends just six months at at Benfica, becomes one of the most expensive midfielders in Europe. You don't get the time for those players you develop to actually hit the highest point in their career at your club. They're gone before you develop them to that level. Suddenly at Liverpool, these players that he'll be able to develop, even if you look at our, our academy boys as well, you'll get the best years of them. Ruben Amarim never gets the best years of his players because the selling model in Sporting Lisbon means they move on before they blow before up. Before they actually moment. become the player that he thinks that they can become. Well, That's he's a great point, isn't it, Mush? Because, uh, Zach, by Mush, that, you know, yeah. he's had to, and like you said, he's had to nurture these players, coach these players to a level, but then had to sell them. At Liverpool, the chances are that he would have not only be able to develop them, develop them but to see the fruits of his labor yeah yeah for sure and i mean i think that uh in in portuguese football uh, in a landscape which is dependent upon player trading i think that it's it's so important you know as somebody who's been following the league for you know a decade or so uh it's, it's so important to get the timing right i think that um, you know, last season when Benfica won their first league title in four years, that was a great example because they sold Darwin Nunez early on in the window, got a lot of money from him, and they were able to replenish their squad, uh, bringing in some very good players like David Neres, Frederick Arsenis, and boom, ending ended up winning the title, even with Enzo leaving midway through. Um, whereas that same season with Sporting, um, you know, they sold Joao Paulinha, who actually uh, was was first really, he, he first really came to the fore while he was on loan at Braga and uh, working under Amorim, playing some of the best football there. And then, of course, reuniting uh, with, with Amorim at Sporting. Um, so he, he, I think that in general, like I said, he's been able to do a very good job of, of adapting to player transfers like you know, Joao Mario, when he uh, when he left Sporting after playing a key role in that title and, and went to Benfica, they didn't sign up a replacement, really. They, they just went with uh, Mateus Nunes, trusting him alongside Paulinha and, and, of course, bringing in Ugarte as well. But uh, last season, where probably we can say it was the nadir, the nadir of, um, of, of Amorim's time at the Albalad, like... They lost Paulinha to Fulham in July, I think. They lost Mateus Nunes like two or three days before their first big game of the season when they played Porto. Um, and, and 
and Poro they, from Spurs. Oh, yeah, Pedro Poro. Yeah, Pedro yeah, Poro. yeah, Pedro Poro in January, and January. they like really didn't sign a replacement. I mean, they sold Hector Bellerin, which ended up being kind of a disaster. So it was clear that with with all of these um, players leaving and without really the requisite replacements coming in, it was always going to be very tough for them to to replicate that. And of course. Um, they ended up finishing fourth last season, but now they are on, uh, obviously on track to win the league title, have a very good chance of winning the Tasa de Portugal. Um, and I think once again, you, you know, they, they followed that blueprint, getting a big money sale uh, underway when, when the window has just started, right? Selling Manuel Ugarte to PSG for like 60 million euros early on in the window and then adding to their squad, getting in. Uh, obviously, Victor Gioquere is probably the best player in the league right now. Getting in Morten Hijolman from Lecce, who's been a phenomenal replacement for Ugarte. And, uh, and and overall, just having everybody on the same page. But but yeah, of course, I think that that is going to be a, a big motivating factor. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think that Amorim is necessarily in a rush to leave the Alvalade. But if he does leave, I, I certainly think that's going to be one of the biggest reasons to be able to actually develop these players, to be able to work with them this summer. I mean, I think that it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that Jokeres will leave for an astronomical sum, probably uh, a club record sale for Sporting. But there's going to be a lot of other players who are going to have a lot of interest, like Diomand, Ignacio, uh, Morita, some, some very good players with a lot of interest and I think that's that's certainly something that Amorim is going to be able to look forward to when he does join a Liverpool, a Real Madrid, whoever it is, being able to hold on to these players, being able to enjoy them when, you know, that they're actually household names and uh, not just having to, not just being resigned to seeing them walk out the door and, and leave for some of the biggest teams in Europe. Um, Mush, mm. I want to get into sort of what people want to know in terms of playing style. What is his strategy? How is he? What kind of manager is he? Uh, there was a there was a great comment here. Uh, where is it gone? Uh, there we go. Sam says Amrim idolizes Mourinho, and I'm sure Mourinho would tell him to take the LFC job if offered it. We need someone that wants to manage LFC. Amrim seems to have that personality, and with a great squad to start. Everything that Zach mm. said in terms of player development, in terms of turning gems into, or uncut gems, you know, into you know improving them and 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 that's fine but we want to know what kind of personality and what kind of character he is off the pitch as well what, what kind of relationship does he have with fans is he able to rouse the cop like Jurgen Klopp or a Mourinho would be able to you know um do you do you think it's important to have that as a Liverpool manager I do I couldn't agree more I think um I think that comes hand in hand with being mm. a successful Liverpool manager. I think one thing that Liverpool manage, Liverpool fans are is that if you connect with us emotionally, we give you lots of time, we get, give you lots of leeway, and we are the kind of fan base where we'll try and find the good in what you're doing rather than picking holes. I think, you know, certain fan bases, you know, maybe the way Abramovich built up Chelsea or maybe United recently, it's a very, not saying it's right or wrong, but it's a lot more of a ruthless culture and a, a lot of high expectation. I think Liverpool fans do have a healthy amount of patience when it's the right person. Um, a big thing I wanted to say about what you said about how he builds a squad, I'm sure Zach will probably specify a lot more in tactics, but one thing that I found amazing whilst he was reading, and this is really relevant, Grizz, because we need to be aware of the limitations that FSG provide as well. It's not just, you know, it's not just a, a blank checkbook. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of barriers you need to navigate. And one thing that yeah. I found really cool, um, I'll probably get the names wrong. Zach, if you remember them, let me know. Zach's but one used thing, to my accent. It's not a problem. Don't worry. He'll <laughs> um, one thing that I really liked was Ruben Amarim does this thing that when he finds out a player might be getting sold or is the next player to kind of move on, he picks out a player in the squad or the youth team and he starts tailoring their training suddenly to change their position or to change their role in the squad. There was a central midfielder who suddenly now is their best left back. There was a midfield, a striker who scored 20 goals for them is now one of their best central midfielders. This is a manager who adapts to the limitations or problems that come his way. And when you're a manager for Liverpool and have FSG, 
who will suddenly sell a player or you won't get the targets you want. You need to be able to rejig your squad and deal with those challenges. I don't think there's many managers who have demonstrated that like Amarim has. Zach, I was going to say to you, um, what is he like in terms of with relationship to the fans? You mentioned and you told us that he came from, he played for Benfica. Now that's quite the move, right? That's the equivalent of, I don't know, Manchester United to Liverpool maybe or something like that in the, on yeah. those levels. So we know his ability to mess or fight or compete with the big boys of Porto and Benfica, the money powerhouses, the financial institutions. Does he use the fan base's strength and, the, and very similar to how Klopp uses, Klopp can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Manchester United or a, or a Man City in terms of financial clout for players. He needs other skills. He needs the crowd. How many times does he rouse the crowd? Has Amrim got that? What's his relationship like with the media, for example, in press conferences? Has he got an aura about him? For sure. I mean, I think that there are a lot of similarities between Sporting and Liverpool, but also a lot of similarities between what Amrim has been able to do uh, out the Albalad and what Klopp has been able to do at Anfields. Um, and I think that you, you really only need to tune in for the first five minutes of a sporting match to see that, you know, seeing the sporting fans belt out the, uh, the, the, the their version of My Way by Frank Sinatra. It was so, oh, okay. <laughs> They've got something like that. Okay, right. I like that. It's like their version of You'll Never Walk Alone. But, um, but, but yeah, I, I think that he has definitely delved into that kind of working class mentality that the feeling of having to pull yourself by pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and like let's not forget sporting they're not just like uh they're not just a small fish in a big pond when it comes to european football but also portuguese football like they don't have as many as much uh in terms of finances as, as porto and benfica historically so they've always been been forced to uh adapt in in that case but i think as far as his um as far as his off-the-pitch skills go, I think that's definitely one of the biggest reasons why Amorim is uh, okay. such a hot commodity. I think that's that's a big reason why, um, you know, despite the fact that he's he's won quite a few, he's won, um, you know, fewer trophies than Sergio Conceição at Porto, I think he's going to have a lot more interest because whereas Conceição is more of a fiery, um, acerbic personality, Amorim is definitely more jovial, and and I think that like he is not going to come to odds with his players. I think for, for the most part, he's done a very good job of making every single one of his squad of, of his players, whether they're on the bench, whether they're in the youth team, you know, feel, feel wanted, part of feel it. appreciated. I feel like you know, and and I've been following Amorim since he took charge, since before he took charge at Sporting, but uh, since since he took charge at the Albalad, I think. Like the only player who he's fallen out with is Islam Slimani, who I think was clear from from the time he joined was more of a board signing, you know, trying to bring back a a very good striker who was past his prime, who who didn't really have that much interest in pressing and and of uh, you know making an impact off the bench. And I think he's been proven right in that regard. I, I think that yeah. for, apart from Slimani, like every single player who's worked with him will, will tell you the same thing that he's. He's a fantastic coach. He's a fantastic communicator, and he's somebody who is who is very quick to, um, you know, whenever Sporting win, he's very quick to give the credit to his players or even his fans. Uh, whereas when Sporting lose, he'll be saying like, "Oh, the reason we lost because we have a uh, young, unproven manager who still gets things wrong every now and then, who doesn't know how to manage games." So he's very humble and very good at. At that, you know, whereas someone like Conceição or even Roger Schmidt at Benfica will get into a tussle with the media yeah. um, or some of his own players, he's never he's never been like that. He's never been like antagonistic. He's somebody who, yeah, ha has always done a very good job of um, of being not just a very good coach, but also a gentleman in press conferences, in training sessions. He's he's definitely uh, shown that that ability, and I think that in today's uh, landscape in today's footballing landscape, being a good communicator, being a good man manager, um, that is just as important. Like we've seen that with, with so many coaches like Zinedine Zidane, right? Knowing how to manage these big egos and personalities. I feel like Amorim has that in bundles. He's, he's somebody, it's clear, 
you know, seeing him, uh, you, you know, the way he approaches management, it's, you know, you, you can obviously tell that he was just a, a player just, what, a decade ago. And uh, he knows how valuable these these players' uh, lifestyles, how they're how valuable and fragile at the same time. They're, you know, as as somebody whose whose career was cut short by injury, he's definitely somebody who is able to relate to them and tap into that and and get the most out of every single one of them. And and overall, you know, make sure that they're all going to uh, that, that that they're all on the same page, right? You know, whenever it's it's like the saying goes, you know. If, if everybody is uh, is rowing at the same pace on the same side, the boat is going to go a lot faster. Yeah. And if somebody isn't doing their job, if somebody isn't putting in the work, then the boat is going to go a lot slower. Yeah, I, 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 I was, was going to say, say, Grizz, what a famous quote from a, a certain Liverpool manager I recall in his first ever press conference said, I'm not the special one, I'm the normal one. Yeah, I was, I was, about, I was just going to say that. He's, he's, he is a normal one, exactly. I, I, I was just going to mm. say, everything Zach was saying was reminding me of a young Jurgen Klopp. So much similarities. Listening to Zach, as Gunit says, makes me think there are so many similarities in his character to Klopp more than Mourinho. Because even though people are saying playing Star Wars, it might be Jose, characteristics and personality seems to be more like Jurgen Klopp. Um, I've got some uh, quick fire questions from uh, Mush, but before that we've got a super chat from Havard. Thank you very much for the contribution. He says, what kind of players do you think Amrin will be looking for? Do you have two or three examples? Buys from Portugal, question mark. Bigger chance, does he go for South America? Or is he a yes man? Uh, what I think <laughs> I would ask in terms of is he a yes man? What's his relationship with like with the sporting director? Because obviously Liverpool have got a new sporting director. I think you've actually answered that that he's not a type to fall out with yeah. hierarchy and and he, he's very much a a people's manager, man manager. Um, but in terms of playing style, what kind of playing style does he favour? In terms of what kind of players um, do you think which to which which continent which style of player would he target? Um, I mean, I think that it's it's definitely going to be a little different uh, going if he does go to Liverpool. Obviously, they'll have quite more finances. But uh, with that being said, Liverpool are a team that that are not going to be uh, caught up in in terms of trying to overspend for the biggest names. Right. We saw that with the Lavia and Caicedo chases. Um, so, you, you know, I, I think that it's it's hard for me to pinpoint like a certain market that he'd be looking at. As far as South American gems go, I mean, yeah, he has worked with with quite a few players from South America. Uh, Franco Israel, the the current goalkeeper, Uruguayan, but he he did come from Juventus's academy. Uh, Manuel Ugarte had only been playing um, in Portugal for like six months after joining from from Uruguayan club Phoenix, and um, so he he had only played just a few months before Sporting paid the big bucks for him. And uh, there are a few other cases as well, I believe. But uh, I think in general, uh, looking at his looking at, um, uh, you know, his signings over the past few years. I mean, there's Gilquerez coming from a phenomenal season in the championship and, and just being completely unstoppable. There's Morten Hjelmund, uh, you know, the captain for Lecce. So I think he, he definitely looks for uh, players who are physically um developed who who are very good leaders as well um yeah i'm trying to think of other examples he also i mean i've talked a lot about young players but he's i think in general he's done a very good job with with uh with established players, players as yeah, well yeah. you know like sebastian kawatz he's been phenomenal he was so good in that title winning campaign uh antonio don yes he's fallen off uh, the past year or so, but he was also very important in that title winning campaign at what 35, 34 years of age. Pablo Sarabia having a complete career renaissance. Um, so he, he's definitely not the kind of player who's just going to be focused on young players. He definitely understands the importance of having a good mix between youth and experience. Um, I definitely think that he would be looking for uh, some players that he has experience working with, right? We, we've seen that. Um, quite a few times, right? Bringing back Francisco Trencao uh, when he was kind of in a crossroads in his career, bringing him back to sporting, having previously ushered him into the Braga first team. And um, and and so I think that he would be looking at Portugal. He'd be looking at uh, uh, players who he has experience with, but players that he, he knows, you know, 
perhaps somebody somebody like uh, Antonio Silva or Wenderson Galeno, who you know he's he's gone up against as sporting manager, and he knows how good they are. Um, so yeah. Bones okay. Roll, bones roll. Mush, I know you've I'll, got a few fine, fine, fi quick fire quick... questions. But let's see how many we can rattle through in the last. Yeah, five some quick fire ones, Zach. So I'm I'm interested to know. I'm a strategist by trade, so don't worry, it's not going to be too interviewee. Okay, um, where would you say Amarim so far has failed as a manager? It's an interesting question. I mean, I think that Amarim, the 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 few times where I have been critical of him, it's I I think a little too stubborn in terms of his. Uh, in terms of his approach, you know, he, he's a he's a manager who's very committed to his style of play, to his formation, his tactics, and it's it can sometimes seem like he doesn't really have a plan B. Um, so so I think that's that's definitely a, a clear example. I think that uh, you know the the three four three he's obviously stuck to that since he since he took charge of Sporting. But there are some times where I was feeling like, especially when when Pedro Porro left uh, mm -hmm. in in midway through last season, where it's like. You know, you really don't have a Poro replacement. You've got Bayerin and Eshkayo, and like neither of those players are capable of providing that threat down the wings. Um, or, and I would also say perhaps a little stubborn stubbornness uh, in terms of his favorites. You know, uh, there have been times where like he's he's just stuck with Paulinho um, at the center forward position instead of giving someone else a choice, even when Paulinho was not really doing much. Obviously, we uh, see on the screen here he has a brace against Boavista, but uh, but but I think that he there have been a few times where it seems like he's a bit too um, you know playing favorites, and um, you know I I think that Pedro Gonzalez is perhaps another example of a player who's been very good for him over the course of his sporting career, but there have been times where it's like Pedro Gonzalez has not really been doing that much, and yet like after sporting uh you know after they get a player sent off or or they need um a change like he automatically goes with taking off edwards or trinkau instead of gonzalves so i think but I, I, the I, thing I, I is, this sounds so much like Klopp as well I was what, just we, gonna say say, about, what yeah. we say about he never he never takes henderson off or you know it's always the same midfield it's yeah. i feel like stubbornness is important when you're in, implanting an idea right Chris? Yeah. Absolutely, I think I think I was I was thinking exactly the same. All the great managers have a sense of stubbornness about them. Yeah. How many City fans have I spoken to have said Pep Guardiola? He just doesn't make any changes. It's just his way <laughs> or the highway, you exactly. know. And Jurgen Klopp, we used to say, only this year we've noticed a change in Jurgen Klopp's substitutions, adaptability. Um, people mentioned his style, and I've seen a lot of comments talk about his pragmatism, and he's a very defensive, and he's a very park-the-bus Mourinho-esque manager. But this is just... The, and, and my answer with that to be Zach would be like, considering that they're the top three biggest clubs in, in Portugal, Benfica, Porto, and Lisbon, every game they go into, except the derbies that I've mentioned, the two teams that I've mentioned that play against each other, they'd be favourites. And they'd have a majority of the ball. So he can't be pragmatic to win a league. He must be forward thinking. He must be front foot. And this average position from the last game, which they won 6-1, was it, Zach? Or 6-2? Something like that. Shows the average positions on the football pitch when they're playing a lower level or lower place team. Suggests that that's not pragmatic. If that's an average position, and I've been looking through the average positions in yeah. various games, He's quite brave and daring, right? Yeah, it is. And I mean, it should be noted as well that Sporting fell behind within five minutes of that, of their most recent match against Boa Vista. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think that there have been quite a few occasions where Sporting will fall behind. And, but because of that consistent approach, that, uh, that commitment to their, you know, the my way or the highway mentality, you just get the sense like there's no way Sporting aren't scoring, you know, and, and I've gotten that sense a lot more this season than previous seasons in part because they do have an unstoppable player named Victor Gilquerez, who's just simply a cut above the rest. Um, so, of course, player quality, individual player quality is definitely going to make a huge difference. But I also think that being committed to one tactical identity, uh, where, which is the 3-4-3, the three, three, getting players forward, pushing the opposition and trying to, uh, you know, to, to force them into making mistakes in their buildup, that is something that really has come to define 
Amorim's time in charge. That's Mush, another. Man- I know another. I know another manager who does that as well. Exactly, I Mush. I was just thinking, Mush, very quickly, Mush. Imagine putting Liverpool players in that formation. We'd we'd be licking our lips at that sort of <laughs> sort of kind of smothering of other teams in the other half. Can you imagine 100%. that? Hundred percent. And even the way it is now, if you look at the block that protects behind it, it's basically the centre backs, some defensive midfielders. That, that that's what it is. So like. I don't know, man. I hope everyone enjoyed the show anyway. But the big thing is, I think, Zach, the more we've spoken, I'm just seeing a lot of overlaps of the things I've learned to love about Jurgen Klopp. Yeah. And and I think, um, like I said, I came in not with a why isn't it Alonso mentality. I'm open. And I think the more I'm looking into this guy, if I'm going to personally start developing a favourite that I'd want for the job, I think Ruben Amarim's becoming more and more of the guy and also i think zach the other thing is alonso is a legend at three clubs or four you know three big clubs ruben amarim will feel like the liverpool is the peak of his career and he's going to want 10 years there i feel like even if jabby alonso came to liverpool every two three years those other clubs would keep knocking right yeah no for sure and i mean the one thing i will also say is that i do think that if, if there is one drawback of the liverpool job it's that it is just so hard to go into a, a, a coach a coaching position where it's a transitional moment where a legendary manager is uh, is going to be departing. Right? We saw that with um, with David Moyes in in Manchester United. We saw that uh, with you know Rafa Benitez at Inter taking charge after Mourinho. We saw that with Benitez taking charge after Zidane at Real Madrid. Like, it is so rare that you'll see uh, a manager come into the helm and even be average. Like, it, it is mm. more often that you'll see someone just completely flame out because of the, the weight of expectations as well as it, it's very hard to to take charge in uh, a club where that's going through a transition. So I do feel like that's, that's another reason why Alonso decided to wait on Liverpool. He, he knows that the opportunity it may not come around, but it also may it, it may come around again. And I also mm. think that he he realizes that Liverpool, uh, it's just going to be a lot better if he if there's a buffer period and and he gets the sense that he's he's not going to have to start from scratch, right? And I think that's that's another reason why. I mean, quite frankly, I'm not trying to offend any Liverpool fans, but I think that he believes that Real Madrid is more of an attractive proposition. You know, there's Werner. nothing offensive about Real Madrid being the biggest team in the world for me, anyway. Yeah. Chris. Absolutely, I don't know if absolutely. You're I mean, the... people people often try to throw that ass like Madrid. Hey, Madrid are the biggest club ever. Simple yeah. as that. There's mm-hmm. no harm in that. Uh, yeah. But we're the biggest club. In, we're the biggest club in, in in Great Britain, and that's what we're, we're that's where we reside, and that's what we care about. Uh, big up Ben, my my friend uh, says us getting Amrim Alonso to Madrid in a year, the manager f- manager pool for City, Chelsea, and United becomes absolutely terrible. Clever move by the Reds, stuck with all the English manager shy. Uh, <laughs> point, you know, the, the pool of managers it, it does it, it becomes decreases if we take away Amrim. Um, but I think it's time to drop the exclusive. Um, I did promise the viewers and subscribers, and they've all been patient. Um, I don't know how many likes we run, but I hope there's 300 constantly of you. And I know I don't normally stream at this time, but because of Ramadan and fasting, me and Mush decided just to kill a bit of time just before we, we open our fast would be a decent time. Um, guys, I believe, I think, all the usual ITK terminology. I believe Liverpool have begun talks with Ruben Amrim uh, this week. Um, I I tweeted it last week that they will be having talks this week. And then, lo and behold, um, the Zabi Alonso story erupts this week, which rules Zabi Alonso out. And then, obviously, all the main journalists, Ornstein, Joyce, Melissa Reddy, have suggested Amrim is the front runner. I think the deal is more advanced than we think. I think we've had very positive initial talks with Amrim um, and I expect Ruben Amrim to be the next Liverpool coach. After hearing that and after hearing Zach, how do you feel, Mush, now? A bit more content? Um, I feel excited. Excited? About the future. I think it's exciting to have someone who being at Liverpool is the biggest moment of their career so far. It's exciting to have someone who will have a new management team, a new board structure, a new set of players and an academy that's coming through. 
the kind of person who we need for this manage, manage like this club right now is a Ruben Amory. We need someone who's going to guide. And I know some people might say that he doesn't come with the biggest trophies ever won. But you know what, guys? I think we are in a very transitional moment, the same way Arsenal were after a safe few years with George Graham, where they won things. And Arsene Wenger appeared from nowhere. But he came with all those human quality, qualities and developmental qualities. And he was plucked out of Japan. Don't worry about sport in Lisbon. He came from Japan. Yep. So you need to remember, Liverpool fans, that when one door closes, others open for a reason. Yeah. And some of the worst moments lead to the best moments. If Steven Gerrard doesn't slip, maybe Jurgen Klopp never joins Liverpool. Yeah, if, fine margins. If Fernando Torres never goes, you might not see Luis Suarez play for Liverpool. All yeah. of these moments that we think things are going to be bad forever, they're not. It's just our fate taking a new direction and we're going to be here to tell you about it, to live it. Absolutely. Zach, very, very, very quickly, um, as I said, I believe Ruben Amrin will be the Liverpool coach. Um, I asked you the same question with regards to Darwin Nunes. I asked you the same question about uh, who else was the player? I can't remember now. There was a couple of players and I said, will they be a success at Liverpool? And you said, yes. Um, will Ruben Amrim be a success at Liverpool Football Club? Mr. Zach Lowry. <laughs> I, I think so. I hope so. I think that, like I've said, I, he's, he, he really ticks a lot of the boxes. He's fantastic in terms of developing players, getting the most out of them, and making every single player in the squad and the youth team as well feel wanted, feel appreciated. Uh, he's somebody who's just very good at instilling that tactical identity and, and going into uh, these these games with a fearless style. I think that that's that his uh, jovial uh, attitude as well as you know his his gentleman approach is, is going to uh, take a lot of fans uh, and and allow them to allow him to be ingratiated into the fan base. And yeah, I, I think that patience is needed. Let's let's not forget this will be his first. Um, actually, I mean, I think apart from a year at Al uh, Wakra in Qatar, like this will be his first job out of Portugal. So I definitely think that patience is is re required. You know, I I, I think that um, obviously Liverpool challenging for all of these trophies, it it could lead some fans to think like we are going to be in the same spot next season. You know, pushing for a quadruple, but that's not necessarily going to be the case. It's it's going to be very tough. Uh, for for Amorim in, in his first few months in, in in management in England, right? The Premier League is a completely different game to the Premier. But with that being said, there have been so many uh, players who've been able to to flourish in in that adaptation from Portugal to England. I feel like Amorim has definitely done enough to to take charge of that uh, to to step into the void and take charge of Liverpool. And yeah, like I said, patience is needed. But I, I do think that Liverpool fans, for the most part, um, you know, in comparison to to other fan, fan bases like Chelsea or United, I feel like in general that they tend to be a lot more patient with their new signings. Um, and so hopefully that's the case with Almorim or whoever, because the fact is uh, replacing Klopp, the, the greatest manager of their modern era i mean it's it's a near impossible job i yeah. can't overstate just how difficult it's going to be but like i said i think that amorim is is going to be i think when it's all said and done people may even see him as a better option than alonso because as mush mentioned like uh that, that's always going to be that would always be in the back of everybody's mind like is is alonso going to leave uh for for real madrid or some other team that's that's a problem that Liverpool have have faced um, a, a lot. You know, mm -hmm. having to lose these players, we've saw we've seen that with likes of Suarez and Coutinho. You know, we may even see that this summer with Trent or, or another key player. But I think that in general, uh, yeah, as as you guys stated, like this would definitely be the peak of his of his entire footballing career as a player or as a manager, getting the chance to manage one of the biggest teams in football and make his mark there. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely, I, I wouldn't, I'm not going to jump the gun and say that Liverpool are going to be challenging for the title just as they have this season. But I, I certainly think that he is going to do a good job of 
of, of setting the foundations. You know, we might, we might see something similar to like Guardiola's first season at the Etihad where, you know, a lot of people are, are thinking, well, we've been sold the, the, this, that fact that this, this guy is like the best manager in the world and he's not doing much. But like I said, I think that it could very well pay dividends a year or two down the line as opposed to immediately. I think that you, you have to trust the process and, and, Sporting have certainly tr- trusted the process, right? Going from finishing fourth, um, in, you know, a few months after uh, appointing Amorim to winning their first league title in 19 years. Um, and so, yeah, and you, you also have to remember the fact that this guy is, what, 37, 38? Um, he is I think he's just turned 39 now. 39. He's a yeah. child in management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Klopp, a year older than James Milner. <laughs> That's yeah, wow. how he is. I mean, Klopp had a decade of experience in the Bundesliga when he took charge. Amorim has had what, like four or five years uh, in in coaching alone. So I, I think that you have to temper expectations. But yeah, I think that I think that he is definitely uh, for me with, with Alonso. Uh, out of the equation, I certainly think that Amorim is the best option for Liverpool's vacant manager. Well, there you go, people. If you needed an, a concise, insightful debate, chat, inquisition <laughs> into the credentials of, of Ruben Amorim, hopefully we have provided it with, for you for the best part of an hour. In fact, just over an hour. I want to thank uh, Zach uh, so much for coming on. Uh, it's it's amazing, isn't it, Zach? How much Portuguese links we have with Liverpool, and and then every time there is something to do with Portugal, I get the main man himself. Thank you very much, guys. Make sure you're going and following Zach on all his socials, doing great work for so many different platforms. So learned, so knowledge, and so humble with his opinions and knowledge as well. Zach, thank you so much um, for coming on. Mush, I will chat to you. Continue to to uh, to chat to you, and we'll be back. Hopefully sooner rather than later. We'll have uh, Cop and Carnage next week back on track. Yep. Mad, mad games and tense, tense filled end to the season. But we will be there. So thank you, Mush. People, you've been amazing. The the questions, so respectful, so brilliant. The community f- continues to flourish. Smash the like if you haven't. Um, thank you, Ganto. This has been great. Big up Grizz, Mush and Zach and the chat, including the Ten Hog Trolls. We've had a few Ten Hog Trolls in there as well. <laughs> So, but you're all welcome. You're all welcome. People <laughs> think that the the death of Liverpool Football Club is nigh. Oh, but if you've listened how to wrong this show, they are. how wrong they listen are. to this show today, <laughs> how wrong you are. Viva Amarim. Thank you very much. Over and out, people.